The purpose of this video is to provide general information and education about the care of a critically ill child. It is in no way a substitute for the independent decision making and judgment by a qualified health care professional. The information contained in this video should not be used to make a diagnosis or to overrule the advice of a qualified health care provider, nor should it be used to provide advice for emergency medical treatment. Non-Rebreather Mask and Manual Ventilation Bag by Dr. Robert Pascucci. Please note that in this video we will be following the guidelines used at Boston Children's Hospital. Some of this information may need to be modified based on the equipment, guidelines, and practices in place in your institution. Hi, my name is Bob Pascucci. I'm one of the ICU staff here at Children's Hospital Boston. I wanted to spend a little time today with you going over ways to deliver oxygen to a child who is in respiratory distress. Um, I should say at the beginning that I'll be using fairly standard pieces of equipment. They may or may not be immediately available to you in your practice, and if they're not, I think that there are probably things that are very similar that would be available locally for you to use. Non-rebreather mask. Now, the baby who's in respiratory distress will be breathing fast and also breathing fairly vigorously so that the gas flow going in and out of their nose um, will be high. Uh, you can supply oxygen with a simple blow-by apparatus, so just a, a hose or a nasal cannula or a simple mask or something like that. And that will give the baby oxygen, but the baby will also probably be entraining some Romare. One of the ways to deliver a high concentration of oxygen and to avoid the entraining of room air is to use what's called a non-rebreather mask, and that's what I have here. This is a fairly standard piece of equipment that you'll see around uh, in, in many ICUs in, uh, in different parts of the world. Um, now, how does it work? Well, it's very simple. We have to have an oxygen flow, which I'll just turn on over here. And the oxygen flow comes into here and then fills up this bag. And let's just pretend for a minute that the baby is attached. All you really have to do to set this up, and it's really quite simple, is turn on your flow, get a good mask seal on the baby, and that may be a bit of a challenge, but then just set it up so that the bag fills and never completely deflates. And as long as you're doing this, and as long as you can see that the bag is completely full at all times, uh, then uh, you can guarantee that the baby is getting the FI2 that you want. And why is that? Well, the flow coming in here can be any liter speed, but really the liter speed that you need is just the one that will keep the bag full. So it may be four liters a minute, maybe six liters a minute, it may be higher than that depending on how big the baby is and how much distress they're in. Um, but the flow coming in here is probably going to be less than the flow rate going into the baby's nose when they take a deep breath. And that's why the bag is here, because this is a reservoir of oxygen that's provided on the inspiratory side of the limb so that if the baby decides to take a deep breath, the extra flow can come from the bag and not from the room. So instead of pulling in extra room air, they're going to pull in extra oxygen from the reservoir bag. And as long as you've got it set up so the ba bag never completely deflates, you can guarantee to yourself that the baby is getting the FI2 that you want. Uh, whether it's 100% or 60% or 80% or whatever is coming down the tube is what the baby is going to be getting into their trachea. And so this is a good way to deliver a high concentration of oxygen. Now, it's also called a non-rebreather bag, and the reason for that has to do with CO2. Conceivably, if you put a mask and a bag over the baby's face, they might be able to blow CO2 into the bag and then rebreathe it, and that's something that you don't want to have happen. The reason that doesn't happen in this, ba in this bag is because of these little flap valves. And you can see here that there's a valve here and there's a valve here. When the baby breathes in, this valve opens, and gas flow comes into the mask and into the baby. When the baby breathes out, that valve closes and this one opens and the baby breathes out into the room. So it turns out to be one-way flow from here to the bag, bag to the baby, baby to the room, and it doesn't go in the other direction. And that will pretty effectively keep the baby from rebreathing any CO2. Now, as I said, the process of putting this on the baby is relatively simple, although it's a little bit difficult to demonstrate on the mannequin. You get a good tight seal here, set your oxygen flow enough that this bag will fill up and never completely deflate during the baby's breathing cycle. 
And as long as you've done that and you've got the tightest seal that you can do, and you can see the baby breathing in the bag, the bag goes up and down and up and down, then the mask is really set up to do what it's supposed to do, deliver a high concentration of oxygen without the risk of the baby rebreathing CO2. Self-inflating bags. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how you might be able to mechanically support a baby's ventilation if they can't breathe adequately with a mask. And we're talking about different types of bags that you might consider using, and, and they're really two different families. There's the self-inflating bag, which we're going to talk about in some detail, and then there's the Mapleson circuit, McGill circuit, anesthesia bag, uh, which is a different family, and we'll talk about that as well. Let's start with the uh, self-inflating bag because I think people tend to feel a little bit more comfortable with this at first. The big advantage of this bag is that you don't need a fresh gas source. You can work in simple room air so that if you're resuscitating someone in a non-clinical area or at a scene or something like that where you don't have an oxygen source, this will still work. And that is a real advantage of this kind of, of system. Now, how does it work? It's relatively straightforward design and it's very similar to this non-rebreathing mask in that it has valves and a reservoir bag and that sort of thing and we'll demonstrate that. It's just the quality of the rubber or the plastic that makes it go up and down like this. And there are valves in here very similar to the valves in the mask. They're one-way valves. When I let go, this valve opens and gas comes into the bag. When I squeeze, this valve closes, this valve opens and the gas goes to the baby. And then when the baby breathes out, it goes into the room. So it's one-way flow from here to the bag, bag to the child, child to the room. And therefore, you don't have any CO2 rebreathing. So that's one advantage of the system is that you get valves to prevent that from happening. Now, as I said, it will work fine in room air. So I could ventilate this patient very easily without having to have a, uh, an oxygen source attached. And that is a really big advantage of this particular system. If you do want to give oxygen, you can attach it. You can attach it right here. I've got a bag that has it already attached. And there's a reservoir here very similar to the reservoir that's on the non-rebreather mask. Okay? So now if I'm ventilating this patient, as long as I do it in a reasonable fashion so that this reservoir bag doesn't completely deflate, I can give close to 100% oxygen because what happens is the oxygen comes in here, fills up this bag, and the green bag will refill from this bag so that I can be giving a fairly high concentration of oxygen. I can always turn up my oxygen flow to keep this bag full. And if I do that and I squeeze the bag at a reasonable frequency, I'm not going to completely collapse the thing. Now, if I'm bagging more vigorously, and I can certainly do that, I won't be giving much oxygen because the reservoir bag will completely deflate, but I can still ventilate the patient with room air. And that's one of the advantages of the system is that you can always ventilate with room air even if you don't have the fresh gas source available. Okay? So, valves in the system, no rebreathing, ability to give oxygen if you do want to do that. What about other features of these bags? Well, they may have, a, they may have what's called a pop-off valve on them. And that's right here, and you can see this particular design is one that just opens and closes. If I'm ventilating the patient and using a lot of pressure, and perhaps a little bit too much pressure, this valve will pop off, and typically they pop off at around 40 or 45 centimeters of water pressure. The reason for that is so that I won't accidentally give the baby a, a pneumothorax, for example, from using too much pressure. That's an advantage, and it's a potential safety advantage for the baby, but the disadvantage is if I have to use more than 40 or 45 centimeters of water pressure, if I have a baby that has a difficult airway or somebody that's an asthmatic who's particularly tight and needs a lot of pressure to ventilate, the pop-off valve is going to prevent that unless I can defeat it. And this particular sample, I can just put a cap on, and now I can use whatever pressure I need to to ventilate the patient, and, and that's perfectly uh, acceptable. So if your bag has a pop-off valve, you really need to know how to get around it so that in this particular design, it is now popping off and that's fine. Or I can prevent that by covering it over. Or I can even prevent it just by using my finger, but that gets a little bit awkward, okay? That's the way this particular design works, but there are many, many, many different designs of pop-off valves, and what I suggest is that someday when you have a free moment, get the bag that you might have in your clinical area and play around with it and figure out exactly how that pop-off valve works on that particular design. 
That's the pop-off valve. There is a pressure manometer in this particular bag that you can use to estimate what kind of inflating pressure you're using. And some people find that to be a useful addition. Uh, this bag does have the pressure manometer, but this does not have a pop-off valve. So with this particular design, I would just have to be extremely careful with how much pressure I use. And if I'm ventilating a baby, I would use very small motion in my hand. If I'm ventilating a larger patient, then I might be able to use a little bit more movement and a little more pressure. Putting it on the baby, standard kind of mask. You may have a choice of sizes, and you obviously will have a choice of sizes for children. I find in general that if I'm in trouble getting a good seal or if I, for some reason, am having difficulty getting a good seal, going smaller rather than larger tends to work well. Then I'll put the mask, I'll bring the baby's chin up, put the mask on top, get a good seal, and then ventilate the baby relatively effectively. And again, this bag does not have a pop-off valve, so I'm trying to be careful in how much pressure I use, and I'm not really squeezing the bag very much because this bag is probably a little bit too big for this baby. If that's the case and you have the advantage of having a smaller bag, you can always switch to the smaller bag. Same process, get a good seal, and now I can ventilate with this, although now I'm obviously squeezing the bag a little bit more than I was before. So that is the self-refilling bag. The big advantage, you can do it in fresh gas, you don't need a fresh gas source, you can do it in room air. Uh, the big disadvantage, as we'll see in a second, is that it really is designed for ventilating someone who's not breathing on their own, who's apneic. If you have a patient who's breathing spontaneously and able to move some air and just needs some assistance, I think you're going to be better off with the Mapleson system, which we'll talk about now. Mapleson McGill Circuit or Anesthesia Bag. If you have a patient that is breathing spontaneously, you can probably assist them better with the Mapleson circuit, McGill circuit, anesthesia bag, whatever you want to call this thing. Now, this is a completely different design than the bag we've been using up until now. This is really more like a T-piece. There's a fresh gas flow, there's a baby down here, and then there's an expiratory limb. And we'll talk about the design in a little bit, uh, a little bit more in a minute. Uh, the big disadvantage of this is that you have to have a fresh gas source. If you don't have a fresh gas source, you really can't do much and you really can't ventilate the patient. So if you're in a situation where you can't have a reliable source of fresh gas that can run at a decent leader flow, you're probably not going to be able to use this bag. If you do have a fresh gas source, however, the nice thing is that you can let the patient breathe spontaneously. So if this were attached to the patient and he were breathing on his own, okay, uh, you would be able to get a good mask seal or potentially with an endotracheal tube is the same system and then just watch the baby breathe. And if you look at the bag going up and down, you can see that the baby is breathing spontaneously from this bag, okay? So I've been able to get a good mask seal and I've been able to give a high oxygen concentration and I've been able to monitor the baby's breathing all by switching to this particular system, all right? Now, suppose the baby needs a little bit more assistance. For example, someone that you're sedating for a procedure and you give a little bit of midazolam or a little bit of fentanyl or some sort of sedation and the baby starts to get a little bit obstructed, well, in that case, I can just increase the amount of pressure I'm giving the baby, turn up the CPAP, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. And now the baby can still breathe spontaneously, but I've got five centimeters or eight centimeters or 10 centimeters of CPAP sort of splinting the airway open and helping the baby breathe. If I give even more sedation and the baby becomes apneic, then I can just start mechanically ventilating the patient with the same system, all right? And I can adjust the pressures again by adjusting the pop-off valve, all right? And so I can go full mechanical ventilation, and then when the baby starts to breathe spontaneously, I can back off a bit, let the baby breathe spontaneously again, and it's a seamless transition from spontaneous ventilation to full mechanical support, back and forth, back and forth, and you really can't do that with the self-inflating bag. You can really only do that with the Mapleson system. So for me, that's the big advantage of this system is being able to follow the patient a little bit more effectively, allow them to breathe on their own if they can, support their own spontaneous ventilation, and you really can't do that with the self-inflating bag. Now, a few more details about this. Again, how does it work? It is a TP system so that there's fresh gas coming in here. I can adjust the fresh gas to keep the bag full, and that's typically what one would do. Um, you do need to have a fresh gas source, and you can't operate without one. 
What about CO2? Well, there are no valves in the system. There have been valves in everything we've used up until now, but there really are no one-way valves in the system so that it is possible for the patient to rebreathe CO2. For example, if the flow rate is too low coming into the bag, let me just demonstrate this on myself. The bag will keep going up and down, but really it's just me breathing back and forth into the bag, and I am rebreathing CO2 because there's no way for it to get out. So even it, though it looks like I'm being ventilated, I'm really not because the CO2 is just bouncing back and forth. The key to getting rid of CO2 is to have a fast enough fresh gas flow that at the end of every breath, the fresh gas flow pushes the CO2 through the tubing, through the bag, and out the hole, wherever the hole turns out to be, in the valve. So if I turn the fresh gas flow up, now if I breathe, at the end of every breath, the CO2 is getting pushed out of the system, and I am not rebreathing CO2 simply because of the faster fresh gas flow. So the key to getting rid of CO2 in a system like this is to have a fresh gas flow that's fast enough to flush the system in between breaths. And typically you want about two and a half to three times the patient's normal minute volume as a reference for how much fresh gas flow you need to go into the bag. Typically for a baby it'll be around three or four liters a minute. For an older child it may be six or seven liters a minute. And for an adolescent it may be 10 or 15 liters a minute. Enough to make sure that the bag fills up very easily in between breaths and that in fact uh, you are flushing the system and getting rid of the CO2. All right. Now last thing, I keep talking about valves and this particular system doesn't really have a valve in it. The valve in this particular case is the hole at the end of the bag and I'm just squeezing that with my fingers to generate the effect of a valve and PEEP and CPAP and that sort of thing. Many designs will have <clears throat> a valve built into the system and it will either be located here, here or somewhere else in the system. And you can adjust that valve ahead of time to generate a certain amount of PEEP or CPAP. You can set it to 5 or 6 or 8 or whatever you seem to want. And the advantage of that is that it's a lot easier to control the pressures that you're giving to the baby and know that you're generating the CPAP at the end of the breath that you want. Uh, the disadvantage of the valve and the reason we tend not to use them here is because it's potentially possible that they will stick and then uh, be a potential risk to the patient because the system is a closed system and if the valve isn't working, then all that pressure is going to get transmitted to the baby. So for various reasons, we don't use valves here at Children's Hospital. We tend to use our fingers and a cutoff tip and that functionally is the same thing. It's just a little bit trickier to learn how to use. Now, on the baby, Again, I will tend to choose a smaller mask, come around, get a good mask seal. I have to have my fingers on the valve. But once I do that, then if the baby's breathing spontaneously, I can let them go ahead and do that. And you can see the bag going up and down. If they're having a little difficulty doing that, then I can generate some positive pressure and generate some CPAP. And then if the baby really isn't breathing adequately and I want to take over, I can fully ventilate the patient just using this system. And again, it's a seamless transition back and forth between spontaneous ventilation and mechanical ventilation, which you really can't do very well with the self-refilling bag. Summary. So two different systems, two different purposes, <clears throat> advantages and disadvantages to both. The advantage of the self-refilling bag is probably that you don't need to have a fresh gas source and that's probably the biggest advantage. So if you're in trouble and you need to ventilate someone and there really is no fresh gas source, you're probably better off with this. The advantage of this is that once you do have a fresh gas source, you can do a lot more sophisticated work with this kind of a bag because you can generate CPAP, you can generate PEEP, you can ventilate the patient and you can let them breathe spontaneously two different systems and two different purposes. I think you have to make the clinical decision about what's going to work in your particular patient. That concludes our video on non-rebreather mask and manual ventilation bag. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback. What did or didn't you like about this video? Was the content too simple, just right, or too difficult? Was the length too short, just right, or too long? Any additional comments?
You can either click the Start a New Discussion button and type in feedback or send us an email at openpediatrics at childrens.harvard.edu. Note, feedback is not required to complete this activity in the Guided Learning Pathway.